Hello and welcome to this lecture on drug targets and signal transduction. In this lecture, we'll discuss the series of events that take place once a receptor has interacted with its ligand. Uh, that series of events is called signal transduction. We'll specifically target the signal transduction occurring after activation of G-protein coupled receptors and kinase receptors, both important targets for drugs and uh, important for drug design and discovery. All right, so uh, let's begin our conversation. Uh, G proteins are membrane coupled proteins, uh, membrane bound uh, proteins that are situated. Um, uh, G protein receptors are membrane bound proteins that are situated on the, uh, they have a receptor on the inner, on the outer surface. Receptor on the outer surface, okay? Um, so this is the G protein couple receptor here. Now the G protein themselves um, are membrane bound and they are situated on the inner surface of the cell membrane. They're made up of three subunits, the alpha, the beta, and the gamma subunits. And the alpha subunit here is able to actually bind to guanyl nucleotides, so GDP and GDP, GTP. Okay. So first the neurotransmitter or um, the hormone is going to bind to the receptor, okay, leading to a conformational change on the intracellular side of the receptor to accommodate for the binding of the G protein. Um, and this is going to lead to a, a substrate Substrate receptor uh, G protein complex. All right, so that's this complex here that is going to bind. Okay, now once it binds, then the G protein that at when it's, it's at resting or inactive has a, a GDP bound to it, that G protein is then going to undergo a conformational change okay so after the G protein is bound to the receptor another conform conformational change this time of the alpha subunit causes the release of GDP followed by binding of GTP the binding of GTP to the alpha subunit then is going to uh, is going to lead to the alpha subunit splitting from the beta and gamma dimer the next step in the cascade depends on which type of G proteins that are present and the specific type of alpha subunits that are involved. Let's go through that um, again here. Now there are at least 20 known alpha subunits, each causing different effects. Um, alpha S, alpha S subunit and alpha I subunit are involved in um, activating or inhibiting adenylate cyclase, which leads to the release of cyclic AMP and phosphorylase kinase A, pro, uh, uh, protein kinase A, protein kinase A. Um, then you have alpha O subunit, which is involved in regulating ion channels, calcium ion channels, alpha I, potassium channels. And so different alpha subunits um, uh, cause different effects on uh, uh, different channels. So let's look at uh, signal transduction that involves uh, GS protein, okay? So G protein coupled receptors are receptors that are coupled with a protein, which is called the G protein. So the interaction of the receptor with this ligand is gonna lead to a series of events that activate the enzyme of the G protein. So GS protein in particular, as we've mentioned before, um, three subunits, alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha S subunit is going to be able to bind to uh, GDP and is bound to GDP covalently. So this is uh, the, the trimer, alpha, beta, and, and gamma. Now, uh, so GDP is bound to to this G protein here. So the ligand is going to interact with the G protein coupled receptor. So this is a G protein coupled receptor here. 
And the binding of the ligand to the G-protein kappa receptor is going to, in, to cause an induced fit. And the induced fit is going to create a or accommodate a binding space for the G-protein to come and bind to the receptor. Once the G-protein uh, binds to the receptor, then there is a, another conformational change that's going to lead to the release of the GDP and binding of GTP, binding of GTP, okay, and bind GT, GTP. Okay. Now, G-protein alter shape, uh, GDP binding site is distorted, GDP binding is weakened, and GDP departs, and you have binding of GTP, okay. Now, after GTP binds to the alpha subunit, there is going to be another uh, alteration of shape and the complex, the alpha, beta, gamma complex is going to be destabilized, leading to fragmentation and release of the alpha subunit. Okay. And now that process is going to be repeated as long as the ligand is going to be is bound to the receptor. As long as the ligand is bound to the receptor, uh, you have more G protein that's going to come to bind and uh, the process is going to continue. Okay. So one ligand leads to the activation of many different G proteins and that's how the signal is going to be activated. So the alpha S subunit here is going to carry the message um, to the next stage and we'll look at what that next stage is. The next stage, the next stage involved the interaction of the alpha S subunit with adenylate cyclase. Okay. So adenylate cyclase um, has an active site that is closed. It and it has a binding site for uh, the alpha S subunit. So the binding of the alpha S subunit to the adenylate cyclase is going to open the active site of adenylate cyclase, which is going to allow uh, the binding of ATP and the conversion of ATP to AMP, adenosine triphosphate to adenosine monophosphate. Okay. The release of adenosine monophosphate is then going to continue the signal transduction pathway. Now, um, G, uh, alpha S subunits have uh, intrinsic GTPase activity. By that, I mean that they are able to cleave GTP into GDP. Okay and releasing a phosphate in the process. So once that happens, then the, um, the GTP is going to be released. The GTP is going to be released. Um, I guess I'm going ahead of myself here. Uh, but once that happens, you have a phosphate that leaves, and instead of, instead of GTP, you have GDP that is bound. The binding of the GDP is going to cause um, a, an alteration in the intermolecular interaction between uh, cyclic uh, between uh, adenylase cyclase and the alpha S subunit, causing those two subunits to separate. Okay, so the alpha S subunit changes shape, um, weaker binding to the enzyme, and departs from the subunit, and the enzyme is going to revert to the inactive state. Now, once uh, the enzyme, once the enzyme reverses inactive state, the alpha S subunit then recombines again with the beta and gamma dimer to reform the GS subunit that we saw at the very beginning. Okay, so you have several hundred FTP molecules that are going to be converted uh, before the alpha S uh, GTP is going to be deactivated, and that's another way of signal amplification. Now the cyclic AMP that's being synthesized is the next messenger that's going to continue the signal amplification. That cyclic AMP is going to enter the cell with a message. And so uh, here is the chemical reaction that actually does take place with chemical transformation. Adenylase cyclase um, converts ATP into cyclic AMP. Okay, And that uh, cyclic AMP is the messenger that's going to enter the cell cytoplasm with a message. All right, so once cyclic AMP enters the cell, um, 
is going to interact with protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is a serine threonine kinase. In the previous lecture, we've looked at the tyrosine kinase, and here we're looking at the protein kinase A, which is a serine threonine kinase, and it's going to be activated by cyclic AMP, and um, that particular kinase catalyzes the phosphorylation of serine and threonine residues on a protein substrate. And the phosphate is going to be provided by, by ATP. Phos phosphate is going to be provided by ATP. So you have serines that can be converted, uh, that can be uh, phosphorylated. And you also have threonines um, that can be phosphorylated um, by the protein kinase A, which, um, and the, the phosphate is going to be provided by ATP. Okay, so again, um, the binding of the alpha subunit that is bound to GTP to adenylate, adenylate cyclase, okay, is going to allow adenylate cyclase to convert ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then is going to enter the cytoplasm and activate protein kinase A. Protein kinase A becomes active and is going to phosphorylate, um, uh, is going to phosphorylate serine and threonines. Protein kinase has four protein subunits, two regulatory subunits R, and two catalytic subunits C. So the binding of cyclic AMP to the regulatory subunits is going to cause the release of the catalytic subunits. Um, so cyclic AMP binds to phos uh, protein kinase A, induces a, um, a conformational change, which is going to destabilize the complex and cause the release of the catalytic units, which are going to be activated and cause um, phosphorylation of serine and threonine. So this is a, a schematic of the catalytic unit. The catalytic unit um, is going to cause phosphorylation of other proteins and enzymes, and the signal is going to be continued. The signal is going to continue uh, the amplification, and there's going to be more proteins that are going to be phosphorylated. So once the once the kinase is active, uh, proteins that contain serine and threonine are going to be phosphorylated. Now let's talk about glycogen metabolism and how that's triggered by uh, adrenaline in the liver. So um, adrenaline is going to bind to a beta, beta, beta adrenal receptor. Uh, the beta adrenal receptor is a G protein coupled receptor and the same mechanism happens. It the, the binding of the adrenaline into the receptor causes a conformational change to the beta adrenal receptor, allowing for the binding of the alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. After the alpha, beta, and gamma subunits are bound, uh, there's going to be a change in the. Um, there's going to be um, there's going to be a change in the alpha subunit, and the alpha alpha subunit is going to release GDP and take up GTP. Once the alpha subunit takes up GTP, then the alpha, beta, gamma uh, trimer is going to be destabilized and only the alpha S is going to be released with um, alpha S with the GTP is going to be released. That alpha S with the GTP is going to interact with the adenylate cyclase, uh, causing the transformation of ATP or the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. Okay, so this is where we pick up here. All right, so cyclic AMP is uh, synthesized, is going to then activate protein kinase A and release the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A. Once protein kinase A is activated, it's going to cause the uh, activation of phosphorylase kinase. Okay, it's going to cause the activation of phosphorylase kinase. Phosphorylase kinase then is going to convert phosphorylase B to phosphorylase A, which is the active form.
Now, phosphorylase A is the enzyme that is responsible for converting glycogen to glycogen 1, to, gly to glucose 1 phosphate, basically releasing more sugar in the body. Okay. The other action of the catalytic subunit of um, um, protein kinase A is um, uh, protein kinase A is to inhibit a uh, phosphorylase inhibitor P. Okay, so uh, so phosphatase is inhibited, and is the other action is to also convert glycogen synthase to um, from the active form to the inactive form. Overall, the activation of protein kinase A and of the catalytic subunit is going to cause an increase of glucose in the system. So in fight or flight situations, uh, adrenaline is going to be released and through this cascade of events is going to cause breakdown of glycogen to glucose 1-phosphate to increase the amount of glucose that's available um, for muscle contraction. Again, coordinated effect leads to activation of glycogen metabolism, inhibition of glycogen synthesis, and uh, is going to release uh, more glucose in the system. Now, it's important to realize that adrenaline is going to have a different effect on different cells. For instance, it can activate fat metabolism in, in fat cells, and um, uh, in other cells, it can cause an uh, increase of uh, uh, glucose breakdown, breaking down of glycogen to give more glucose. So about that last statement, um, depending on which cell adrenaline is going to affect, um, the result may be different. Okay. All right, so there are some drugs that can interact with cyclic AMP signal transduction. Um, cholera toxin, for instance, is going to cause constant activation of that cyclic AMP, which leads to diarrhea. Okay. You also have theophylline and caffeine, which is going to cause inhibition of, of phosphodiesterases. And phosphodiesterases are responsible for metabolizing cyclic AMP, which is going to lead to increased activity of, uh, uh, of cyclic AMP. So theophylline and caffeine are two of these uh, substances that uh, interact with cyclic AMP signal transduction. All right, so signal transduction, transduction involving GI proteins. So they bind to a different receptor than those used for the GS protein, but the mechanism of action is going to be identical. Um, and then the GI subunit is going to bind to adenylase cyclase and inhibit it. Um, so adenylase cyclase is then under dual control. You have brake and accelerator. On one hand, the GS, sub, the GS uh, types of proteins have an alpha S subunit that's going to be that's going to bind to adenylase cyclase and activate them on this on this in this mechanism the GI uh, proteins are, have a alpha I subunit that's going to bind to adenylase cyclase and inhibit it. And there's always background activity due to different levels of um, alpha S and alpha I. Okay, so. The overall effect is going to be uh, is going to depend on which which alpha subunit is dominant, okay. and which alpha subunit is dominant depends on which receptor is activated. Phosphorylation reactions uh, they're prevalent in um, activation and deactivation of enzymes, as we will see here, and it really. Phosphorylation alters a lot of intramolecular binding, leading to change in conformation. So in this case, for instance, the active site is closed. Active site is closed here. Okay, it's closed. Uh, then when phosphorylation takes place, because of the change in the nature of uh, nature, the charge of uh, of the functional groups here, you are actually able to have interaction between the positively charged amine and the negatively charged phosphate here, which is going to cause a conformational change. So once those two bind together, 
Okay, once those two begin to interact together in ionic interactions, this is going to cause an overall change to the conformation of the whole um, molecule, op leading to opening of the active site. Now let's talk about interaction with phospholi phospholipase C, PLC. This involves the GQ proteins. GQ proteins are going to interact with different receptors again from the GS and the GI and uh, they split the same so it's the same mechanism where the alpha subunit is going to split from the dimer okay and the alpha Q subunit is going to activate or deactivate uh, phospholipase C which is a membrane bound enzyme okay. so um, the reaction is going to continue for as long as the alpha Q is bound to the phospholipase C. And again, it has a brake or accelerator effect because in this case, uh, this, can either, um, this can either activate or deactivate the phospholipase C. So at the beginning of the reaction here, you have the alpha subunit, uh, which is gonna be the alpha Q subunit, which is bound to uh, GTP here. And it's going to, in, in the other examples, you had adenyl cyclase. In this one, you have phospholipase C. So alpha subunit is going to bind to the uh, phospholipase C, causing an opening of the active site of, of phospholipase C. Okay. And uh, causing the opening of this active site, which is going to be uh, which which is going to lead to uh, the binding the binding of, of PIP2 which then is going to release inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol. Okay. Now the hydrolysis of GTP here so GTP is here the hydrolysis of GTP is going to lead to uh, GDP being bound to the alpha subunit and because of that, uh, the binding is going to be weakened and cause the alpha Q subunit to depart. Once the alpha Q subunit departs, the active site is going to be closed again and the alpha subunit is going to go back and recombine to reform uh, the G protein complex. And so this reaction is uh, is catalyzed. You have a phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate, which is an integral, an, an integral part of the cell membrane. And uh, PLC is going to break down that uh, phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate to inositol triphosphate. Okay. Inositol triphosphate is a polar molecule and is going to move uh, into the cell cytoplasm. Now, the diacid glycerol is actually going to remain in the membrane. The acid glycerol is going to remain in the membrane. Now, the the drawing of this um, of these molecules tend to minimize the actual length of um, of the molecules. But keep in mind that the R groups here represent long chain of hydrocarbons, long chains of hydrocarbons. Now we say that the, uh, the diacid glycerol is going to remain in the cell membrane. That diacid glycerol is going to uh, activate protein kinase C. Okay. And then protein kinase C is going to move from the cytoplasm to the membrane and is going to lead to phosphorylation of serine and threonine residue on protein substrate. Now the protein kinase C uh, is going to activate other enzymes to catalyze intracellular reactions. Okay, it's going to catalyze other enzymes uh, to activate other enzymes to catalyze intracellular reactions. Protein kinase C uh, has been linked to inflammation, tumor propagation, smooth muscle activity. So there are good targets uh, for these for drugs that will be used for cancer treatment, for instance. This is a schematic of how um, diacid glycerol is able to bind to protein kinase C. Okay, so the acid glycerol moves um, within, uh, protein kinase C is going to move from uh, the cytoplasm 
to the cell membrane. Okay. Once it moved into the cell membrane, the acetylglycerol, which was in the cell membrane, is then going to bind to the protein kinase C. Binding of protein kinase C is going to cause in, an induced fit, which is going to uh, open the active site. So then it will allow the protein kinase C to convert in active enzymes to active enzymes, which is going to lead to enzyme catalyzed reactions inside of the cell. There are some drugs that have the potential to inhibit protein kinase C, and those drugs can be used as potential anti cancer. Uh, Brostatin, for instance, from CMOS. I went a little bit too fast on this. Brostatin from CMOS is one of these drugs that has the potential to inhibit protein kinase C. Now let's talk about the action of inositol triphosphate, which is the other uh, product of, of that reaction here. So inositol triphosphate is hydrophilic and it's actually, it's actually going to enter the cell cytoplasm. Inside of the cell cytoplasm is going to cause the release of calcium by opening calcium channel ions. Then um, that calcium is going to activate protein kinases and the protein kinases in turn are going to activate intracellular enzymes. Obviously the cell chemistry is going to be altered, it's going to lead to biological effect. If this is the cell membrane, you have inositol triphosphate that moves from the cell membrane into the cytoplasm. Um, it's going to interact with calcium stores and cause a release of calcium ion. Calcium ion is going to interact with carmodulin, which is a, pro a calcium binding protein. Um, after binding and interacting with carmodulin, it's going to lead to the activation of kinase, protein kinase. And these protein kinase are, are going to phosphorylate enzymes and cause them to go from inactive to active. And this is going to lead to enzyme catalyzed reactions inside of the cell. Calcium itself also is able to um, impact protein kinase and causing protein kinase to phosphorylate enzyme to turn them from inactive to active, leading to enzyme catalyzed reactions, okay? And then obviously, uh, through many different steps, it is possible to resynthesize that PIP2. Um, one of the purposes of the lithium salt in, um, um, in, um, in uh, neural, uh, I want to say neurochemical imbalances, for instance, is the inhibition of lithium salt, uh, in the inhibition of the synthesis of... Uh, of PIP2 of basically the uh, of it inhibits lithium salts can inhibit the reaction by which inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol combine over several steps to regenerate the PIP2. And so lithium salts uh, can be used in conditions such as manic depressions. Signal transition, uh, tyrosine kinase linked receptors. We covered tyrosine kinase in the previous lecture already. Uh, tyrosine kinase specifically phosphorylate uh, tyrosine residues in proteins. Um, so the phosphate comes from ATP, ATP is converted to ADP, and phosphorylated tyrosine residues are released. Let's look at the activation and phosphorylation of the receptor. Um, you remember the binding of uh, the ligand to the receptor uh, leads to dimerization, and then the active site of one of the of one half of the dimer is going to phosphorylate the active is going to is going to phosphorylate the um, the residues on the other one. Okay. Once the phosphorylation takes place, then proteins are going to actually bind to these regions here. The proteins are in green. So dimerization of the receptor is crucial and the phosphorylated region act as binding sites for further uh, proteins and enzymes. The result is activation of signal proteins and enzyme, which then is going to lead to the message being carried into the cell. 
Now, there are many different signaling pathways. So um, from the receptor, you can have a tyrosine kinase or, or guanylate cyclase. Guanylate cyclase can then um, lead to um, cyclic GMP. Or on the other side, you can have signal proteins that are released. And then those signal signaling proteins that are released are present here. They're listed here. So you have a cascade of events that can lead uh, to the release of those uh, signaling proteins. Um, and then we are going to look at uh, we're going to look at some of these. Uh, uh, this is what we looked at earlier here. Um, Inositol triphosphate and diacetyl glycerol and release of calcium um, and so on and so forth. So um, an example of a signaling pathway here is the the one that that in, that includes growth factor receptor. Okay, so growth factor receptor um, is a tyrosine kinase linked receptor. The binding site is um, on the surface, on the outer surface of the cell, and uh, once um, and the tyrosine kinase active site is uh, the tyrosine kinase site is uh, is here. So once the growth um, growth factor binds to its receptor, is going to lead to a conformational change, lead to a conformational change, which will lead to dimerization. Once the dimerization takes takes place, the active, uh, the catalytic part of the of one half of the dimer is going to phosphorylate the other half of the dimer. So now we have phosphorylation. Once phosphorylation happens, then uh, proteins, specific proteins, um, are going to bind to the phosphorylated site. Okay, going to bind to the phosphorylated site then it's going to lead to the binding of rice protein and GDP and GTP are going to be exchanged. GDP and GTP are going to be exchanged. Okay. Now, this complex is then going to activate uh, RAF and it's going to activate, activate another um, enzyme called MEC and then this is going to lead to the activation of MAP kinase. MAP kinase as then are then going to uh, turn on uh, transcription factors and activate the transcription factors, which will lead to gene transcription. Okay. Okay. This is a quick run through uh, signal transduction. I hope this is helpful. The next lecture is going to cover um, specifically how we deal with agonists and antagonists at uh, at receptors.